Well, we're back. The Great Escape is here again. Myself, Dave and Jay, and this time you find us in England. We've got a challenge to do. We're not sure of what the challenge is yet. So the nerves are kicking in, as it's never uh, anything you look forward to. They always have a little treat in store for us boys. But yeah, we're fishing again. We're fishing together. I've missed them. I've missed the banter, the camaraderie, and the fishing. So uh, we're going to wrap this up, head on and see what the challenge is. Let the good times roll. Okay, so it starts again, boys. <laughs> the aim of the game is to guess what you are eating. Okay. The winner will be the person who has guessed correctly in the quickest time and the most correct guesses overall. You will be blindfolded. You must finish each course. If you're sick, you lose. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Paul out of it already. Okay. He's all sick. Okay, okay. <laughs> Your first course is called Kraken Me Up. Now, it's going to be given to you on a spoon. You need to eat everything that's on that spoon. Right, so the name gives you a bit of a clue, guys. Kraken Me Up, you've got to guess what it is as you eat it, but once again, you've got to finish it. That smells good. Oh, Three, flies, go on in, go. Come on, one, 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 one. <coughs> No. <coughs> Um, fat or gristle, um, it's, it's pig fat. Pig no. fat. P pork, um, beef fat. Oh my god. Fish, fish, some sort of fish. Mm. The cracker, is it um, um, octopus? Close. Um, squid. Squid, yeah. Squid. Yeah. Squid. First one down. There you go. Right. The next course is called the greatest go go. Snail. Snail. Hey. Oh. Oh. <coughs> I'm gonna go oh, oh, oh. oh. <coughs> Snails. I'm finished. <laughs> Only a teaspoon, but that's all you need. Right. I love it. Try and guess what it is. Fish eyes. Oh, Gone. Heart. Fish eyes. Fish eyes. <laughs> you are correct. Well done. Oh, oh. Oh. That makes up for the snail round. <laughs> that is fish eyes. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> is that water? Right, next one guys, this is a big spoonful again. Now there's two parts oh, to I this. Can smell fish. It. Oh, really two stinks. parts to this. It's been oh. nicely cooked. Taking my time with this for you. Oh. Now this is gonna be crunchy, tasty, and the title of this dish is called Nemo Sis. Nevy. Oh. 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 Oh, yeah. <coughs> Can't even eat it, it's too much. Can I? <coughs> <coughs> There's not even anything in it. This is just what. The mouth will go in. The fish is tough. I'm getting nothing here. No. A fish head. I didn't take that. I just said it. Yeah. Oh, it's a fish mouth. <sighs> <laughs> What's the other bit though? This is all bones. Right, I'm going to give these to you. This is your dessert option. Hold it in your hand and I'll count down from three to one. And you've all got to take it at the same time. Three, two, one. So we've got about 40 minutes before we can actually get onto the venue we're going to fish. 
We're going to pop down the supermarket and uh, get a few supplies and food. I'm going to drink, I think, mouthwash or something like that. Just come last in the challenge. But when it comes to Jay and Dan, and it's an eating challenge, I'm probably going to come last every time. These two can actually eat two Big Macs in about two minutes. It's ridiculous. So I know I'm never going to beat them in an eating challenge. But not every challenge will be an eating challenge. And sometimes, on a positive note, coming last can have its advantages because um, it allows me to sit back, see what the others are going to do, and weigh up my options rather than having to make a decision as soon as I get there. So let's see how it goes, fingers crossed. When you say to me carp lake and I shut my eyes and think of one, I think of a 17th century boathouse that's listed. Long rows of reeds, rosy dendrums. Rosy dendrums. Massive oak trees, shallow water, most of all an important carp. And this lake is the kind of lake you dream of owning. Western Park really is like paradise. Well, we've just arrived at the magical Western Park. You come through the gates, drive down a little track, and you're greeted by the most beautiful boathouse. So, I won the draw, I'm over the moon. I spoke to a few locals, just trying to find out a little bit of information, and basically, they've said all three swims are really good. This swim, to me, gave me loads of scope, gave me loads of room. There's lily pads to the left, there's reeds on the far margin, there's overhanging trees. I've decided to pitch up in here. This one's known as the African. Situated, I've got a far margin. I've got some lily pads down to the right. I've got some close-in features. I'm gonna have a little lead around shortly, try and find what's out there, but I'm really pleased with my swim choice and the place itself, it ticks all the boxes. When you think of an old estate lake, it's got everything. It's picturesque, it's atmospheric, it's beautiful. So, coming third in the draw, gave me the last swim choice, which unfortunately is this swim. I would have preferred either of the others because I'm hemmed in here. I've got Dan one side, Jay the other. That doesn't mean this is a bad swim, it just means I'm gonna to have to fish very effectively in this swim. And by that I mean not using a spot and marker, just smashing the swim to bits and moving the fish out of this narrow channel. I'm gonna walk round, bait up by hand, keep noise down to a minimum, and then cast across. I just wanted to be able to fish for a week in comfort, looking at a really, really picturesque lake, and that's why I've chosen the left-hand boathouse. I'm gonna put myself up out of the way, yep. in, the, I think it's called the African. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go up in there with Look, a tree. if you lads don't think it's a bad swim here, do you want the one I'm in? <laughs> <laughs> when we said there's a bad swim, what we meant, me and Dan said, <laughs> we haven't got a bad swim. <laughs> Well, I don't, I'm sandwiched between the two of you, but I know we're going to keep our lines down. And yeah, nice and slack, backleading if we have to, and just keep everything out of the way. Let's see what the week brings. Yeah, I think it'll be fine. I mean, like you say, um, I've got fluorocarbon on, I'm going to be fishing slack lines. Um, maybe one just to my left-hand margin, so I'm not going to be fishing far out there. A couple across to the, uh, to the, to the other far margin. Yep. Um, slack lines, let the fish just cruise up and down, and you know. That's what happens. Yep. Yeah. I've got a week's a long time in it. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of options. So yeah, yeah I'm going to yeah. probably start quite light tonight because we're supposed to now three o'clock already. Yeah, it's just on there, flick yeah. a couple of naked chods out and then uh, try and build some sort of plan tomorrow. Yeah, that's what my plan is. Got a thing about being naked, yeah. And you've got a body <laughs> like mine. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's get out of here. Come yeah, on, let's do it. <laughs>
I found a nice spot on the far margin in front of the main swim that I'm in, the African. Popped the float up, I've got just under three feet, so it's quite a nice depth for the lake. I'm going to go around now, introduce some bait to the other side, but on my travels, walking round, it's a nice little walk and it's getting to the latter part of the evening now. It's the first day we've arrived and I've been met by a really nice secluded bay. Lots of overhanging trees, lots of snags and there's lots of carp in here resident. I've seen them pluming up, fizzing, so I've stepped out of the way. I've made a few ground bait balls made up of some cell and some cell pellet and I've just put a couple in and the fish are turning and coming on it straight away. This is definitely going to be something I'm going to explore during the duration of the week and to be honest when the other lads are baiting up I think they might notice them as well but to see these on, there you go see, not too far where I've put the bait, one's shown over the back so they're in here in quite good numbers and uh, I do think this could be an area that we could visit, we might get a couple of stalking opportunities and it might even be good for a floater but I've prepped it now, I'm going to come back tomorrow and have a little look so let's head on round to the marker float, put some bait in for the first evening and we'll see what happens. I'm just going to uh, move my rods over. I've noticed once I put my pod down that there isn't that much room to land fish. So fingers crossed I do get a bite, but when I do get a bite, I want to be able to land the fish in front of the swim. I've moved it over, I've put longer bank sticks on the front just to raise it up. My line's going to just gently go over these pads and then out to the, uh, out to the swim. I'm going to be fishing pretty slack lines. I don't want to cause any disturbance along here at all. So I want the fish to be able to come all the way up and down with a tight line. I'm worried that's going to spook them. So I'm fishing a semi slack to slack line right the way across. Touch wood, if I get a bite, I'll be able to land them down this side here pretty easily. If I have to wade out a little bit, that's not a drama. It's only shallow in the margins. But yeah, so if you're wondering why I've moved my rods, this way and also this is the great thing about using a pod I can go wherever I like at the drop of a hat I've got no worries whatsoever I am going to go around and put a bit of bait in by hand it's just so much easier I can get the bait that I want out where I want it exactly I haven't got to worry about any crosswinds any uh, noise disturbance with the spot crashing in it's only about two to two and a half feet round now I've got a baiting pole that I got from the tackle box that's going to be invaluable I think because there's a bit of an area there which I can't really get down to so what I'm thinking is I can get as close as I can poke this through the bushes tip out a bit of bait and then do that two or three times over the area and I think that'll be enough to grab a bite. Going into the first night the rods were spot on confidence was very very high I was getting some weird bleeps on my middle rod I just wasn't happy with it by about 1am I decided to bring it in and redo it again Joy of fishing the naked chods, it went out perfectly, bang on the spot, and the next time I got a bite, this one come along. Beautiful 27 pound common, stunning from top to bottom, a few photos, got a bit of video, and uh, slipped her back. First night success on the lake, I couldn't be any happier. Really, really chuffed with this one. Did you get it off the far margin then? Yeah, off far margin, uh, yeah. seven spots over the top. You'd have put you'd have put your car keys on that left hand rod, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But nice. No, um, yeah, good. Really good start. Half past one in the morning. Um, rattled off and good spirited fight. Kind of took out my right hand rod a little bit. Um, but I'm fishing the chod. And it's quite awkward in these lilies. Yeah, that's why I'm fishing them over the lilies because then it gives me a bit of space to land the fish here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it took out the right hand rod. Nothing too. I left the rod out. Like yeah, it yeah. wasn't. But yeah, nip one pearl one in the middle of the night. So. Weren't too bad. And then I lost another one at about half three. Really? Yeah, there's a big weed bed out here. And um, it, it just dived into the weed um, and just cut me off. There's a lot of, there's a lot of old uh, swan mussels yeah. there. I saw them over the back. There's big old ones. And I think they're clamping up on the lines because Dan also got cut off. Oh, did he? Just on a retrieve. Oh, really? So they definitely cause a few problems. Yeah. But it's shallow as well, isn't it? It's, it's not like you can get away from them. You've, you've got, just got... You've got every obstacle in the way, really, isn't you? You've got shallow, you've got swan mussels, you've got weed, you've got silk weed. There's everything. It's proper, proper fishing, isn't it? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah, it's really good. It was a fantastic result for Jay. A really nice fish and I knew it would be time for me to go and prime the areas. I went down to the pads, applied some bait, went back to the bivvy, got some fresh rigs tied, sat back on the bed chair and just watched in anticipation as the rainfall came, hoping that the night would bring my first Western Carp. Really good fishing conditions, overcast, heavy downpours, and I really was looking forward to the night ahead. In the hours of darkness, 
the rod pulled away, an absolute melter, waders on, out in the pond, and there I was, attached to my first Western Cup. We are off the mark, that's the first one in the net. Just getting off the bed for the night, a couple of little bleeps, the line's pulled up tight round the prodding stick, I'm fishing down the margin, up to the lily pads, I've put the prodding stick in, just to keep it away, out of the way of any of the marginal snags or any obstacles, and it served its purpose. It's pulled out into the main body of the lake. After a little bit of two and eight, I'm not gonna lie, it was a complete battle royale. Loads of siltweed all up in the tip eye. Ended up hand lining it in, but I've got the price. It's the first one, hopefully there's more to come. We'll get this one up on the bank and have a look at it. Well, there's fish number one, just over 21 pound, Western Park Mirror. I had a feeling that if any of the rods was gonna go this evening, it would have been that right-hander, and I wasn't wrong. Hopefully this will be the start of things to come. I'm gonna slip this one back, get the rod back in position, and fingers crossed, another one visits the area. The weather is absolutely grim. It's not stopped raining for probably 24 hours. But for me, it's time to get some bait in. Um, I haven't baited for 24 hours now. It's time to get it in. I'm running very low on the bait. And as you can see in the back of my van, I've been super organized for this trip. In this bucket, I've got 15 kilos worth of chops that I did in the office. I've crushed up 15 kilos of the S7, 18 millers there, all crushed up lovely. I've got a bucket full of rock salt and I've got a load of 12 mil boilies in this one. I've not added any glugs or anything like that to them yet. And what I thought I'd do, is get to the lake, take a small bucket into the swim that I'll be spotting from and using, but leave all the bait in the back of the van. I don't have to lug it anywhere. So for me, it like makes life so much more simple. All I simply do, bait spoon worth of chops, bait spoon worth of crushed, Big spoonful of rock salt. And lastly, I put a big spoonful of boilie in. In fact, I put a boilie, about a spoon and a half of boilie in. Once I've done that, I'll get some Hydra wheat. This is the S7 spod syrup, Hydra spod syrup. And I'll pour that all over the boilie. Quite a big, quite a big amount, cover it all over. Then a little tiny bit liquid yeast. This is grim this stuff. Put it on there. All these liquids sink like a stone, so they're gonna make it to the very bottom of the lake where I want it. And nice and easy. Cover all the boily first. So they're all done. And then dig in. All the crushed, all the salt. Everything is going to then stick to the boilies that have been coated. It doesn't take long this way. You don't use half the amount of liquids and you get stinky, horrible goodness. But the carp love it. I love it. That's done. Get back to the swim. Job done. Get some spot out and uh, hopefully get another bite tonight. Catch you later. When you come to a new venue like we've got here, or you come to the Chosen Swim at your syndicate or day ticket lake, if you've got time in your hands and you're not just doing a quick overnighter, it can pay dividends to be using a marker rod. What I've got here, I've got a marker rod set up, but I would be more than happy just to use a naked lead. As long as it's on a braided main line, I opt to use the transmit. It's very responsive. It lets me determine exactly what I'm fishing over out there, whether it be silt, weed, clay, or gravel. What I'm actually faced with here is really low lying silkweed. What this is, it's really stringy, st strangulates all up the line. It can actually be a right pain. Every time I've put a lead out, I'm having to pull off the strands, trying to find the lower line siltweed, somewhere that can present a rig perfectly. You can use the marker rod set up either with a naked lead or with a float like I've got here. I like to use a float because it will let me determine just how deep the water is that I'm fishing over. I'm faced with depths from two and a half foot to four foot. I found this out by playing off a foot 
or one foot, depending on your rod that you've got. There's markers on the blank. You can play it out every half a foot. The float will move. When your float pops up to the surface, you can determine exactly the depth that you're fishing over. What you can also do when your float's up, it's a great indicator to be putting bait out. You can catapult or you can use a throwing stick in and around the float, being nice and accurate. You've got no guesswork out there. You're fishing effectively and efficiently. Hopefully, during the duration of this week, using this will definitely put some fish on the bank for me. After Jay and Dan already getting off the mark, I was keen to catch one myself. I've seen two or three fish show just on dark, so I was really confident of a bite, and I wasn't let down. The right hand rod pulled up tight, and after a good scrap, I landed my first Western Estate Lake carp. Look at that long lean male mirror carp and just the kind of fish you'd expect to find living in an old estate lake. They were all over me last night so I wasn't surprised that this morning the rod ripped off. I had a good little scrap with this one. 21 pounds, it's an excellent start so I'm going to get it back and I might do a tactical change today. I'm not sure what yet. I'm going to put my heads together with the other guys and see what we can come up with. My chosen bait mix for Western Park is something that I've got full confidence in. There's reasons behind all the ingredients that I'm using. I've caught fish all over the globe on this mix. I've caught it on day tickets in England, at my syndicate lake, new venues like I'm faced with here. Maximum confidence, loads of attraction, and it keeps the fish grubbing for a long time. I'm going to give you a little insight now into the mix and what I'm using and why I'm using it. I'll start with the buckwheat. I've been using buckwheat now for probably around 18 months to two years. And on the Great Escapes, we've had some instant results using this. It's a particle similar to hemp. It's a little bit larger than hemp, but it's got lots of crunch. It imitates lots of snails or mussels, which would be out there on the bottom of the lake bed. And the carp absolutely love the stuff. What I like to do, I like to include a liberal amount of this. Before I come on these trips, this stuff I've got here is PVA friendly. I coat it in the PVA cell stick mix to match my chosen bait. And the bait of choice for me is to sell. It's something I take absolutely everywhere. I've got full confidence in it. It's a really good food source. The carp love it and they come back to look for it. It's really digestible. It breaks down nicely, whether I'm using it in a chopper, whole baits or crushed. All the different food sizes, different sizes in the particle, different sizes in the boilie. It will keep them carp grubbing around the area for longer. What it also does, using the chops, when I had a lead around here at Western, there's lots of silkweed present. So what this will do, the chops will flutter down, lay nicely in just on top of the silkweed. And I use a slow sinking hook bait on a helicopter presentation. That will flutter down, similar to imitating the chops in and around where the hook bait would be lying, sitting absolutely perfectly. I also like to include pellet. This again is a cell pellet, same food source, in the same family as a cell. So I've got cell buckwheat, I'm using cell boilies and cell pellet. Pre and post spawn, I like to include some salt. I don't put lots in. When I've got this together in a mix, I give it a good stir up. I make sure that all the ingredients are all combined in together. So the pellet, the salt stick into the pellets, the buckwheat stick into the pellets. Add a few more handfuls of boilies. And as you'll see, there isn't many fish that could resist this. Very fortunate thing here at Western Park, you're not faced with lots of tension, you're not faced with lots of bream. I can get away of using the inclusion of the buckwheat and the pellets and not getting pestered by nuisance fish. Everything I know that I'm going to be putting out, the carp will come in, grazing confidently, loads of different food sizes, gives me different hook bait options. And yeah, this is my go-to mix, not just here. When I go to any new venue, I like to take ingredients and bait choice that I've got maximum confidence in. And this little array here, I have that in abundance. So we're two days in, couple of nights, and it's become really obvious that all the bites are gonna come within the darkness hours, particularly in the swim I'm in. They're moving in between about 12 and one, you can hear them jumping. First night, just fished over a bit of crumb, didn't produce any bites. Second night, fished over about two kilo of boilie, and I've had a bite. 
I'm still not convinced we're nailed down the method that we need to get multiple bites because there was a lot of fish there and I only managed to catch one. So I'm going to do a little tactical change tonight, which I'll show you later. But as the days are so quiet, I'm going to grab my stalking rod today, grab my centre pin and my tent rod, and we'll go around and see if we can't catch a carp on it. It'll be really good fun. All right, me and Dan have just come down to this bay and uh, there's about four or five fish in here. One of them is definitely a 30 pounder and then there's a, a mirror that's a definite upper 20 maybe scrape of 30 and one about 18 pound. So there's sort of three fish in this bay at the moment. They're definitely kicking about in the margins so there's an opportunity. Yeah, so the fish are quite close. They're probably no more than 20 yards. So at the moment, my controller's set at about 30 yards. And as a fish starts taking, that gives me the option without making a splash to just reel back gently into where the fish are. But they ain't going crazy on them, to be fair. They're just very lethargic. Occasionally one's coming up, taking two or three floaters, and then just meandering off. Right, that's it. Back. The mixes are starting to get carried across in the wind now, which is really going to work in our favour. But there's a few things you're really going to want to have with you when you float fishing. Firstly, a set of glasses, because they're going to take the glare off the water and help you to spot the fish. Secondly, you need to be really covert. I like to use a little cell dumbbell pop-up, a size 8 shoddy hook, and what I do with that is I paint a little bit of Tipex on it so that when it's against a white sky the hook can't be seen that saves me having to bury the hook inside the bait these fish are very cagey they're not going mad on the mixers they're coming up and they're just slurping the odd one that was close that was really close that one they're very spooky it took a mixer a couple of feet away and actually spooked so they, uh, you can tell they're used to being fished for on the surface. One thing I've noticed with surface fishing, it's particularly good when you lose a little bit of light level. Because when you lose light level, the fish loses its sight and it's easier to trick. At the moment, we ain't losing no light level and the water's very clear and they're seeing everything. So it's a case of trying to feed them up let them get away with feeding, build their confidence, and then hopefully we'll get to hook one. I think there's sort of two ways you can float a fish. One is to literally leave the float out there, be patient, and wait for a group of fish to come past. And the other is to watch where they're going and continuously try and get in front and predict what's gonna happen, which is probably my favoured method. I like to predict where they're going, get in front of them and keep laying a little trap possibly got the worst floater set up in the world. I'm using a rod that I had built when I was 16 years old and it is falling a bits because unfortunately for me a little while back my barrow tipped over in my van and landed on my lovely 10 foot floater rod smashing it into about four pieces. So I thought I'll take this one fishing with me. First cast at a new lake I had a 38 off the top so it's sort of become my lucky floater rod now and uh, let's hope it can pull it out of the bag today because there's certainly a few fish now. We're gonna catch one any second then. Oh, got yep, we're in. Very subtle take that. That's why these weighted bubble floats are so good. You barely have to strike. I think we was lucky to get one off the top there. They weren't going mad on the surface, but um, just goes to show, sitting behind motionless rods for the afternoon or come and find them. There we go. Yes. He is, yeah. <laughs> Nice one. 20 in it. Lovely one. Yeah. 
Cheers, mate. So, this is easy, isn't it? <laughs> Check him out, proper crusty old estate lake mirror. Probably 24, 25 pounds, didn't bring the scales around. But it was worth reeling them rods in, getting round here, and it's paid off. Now I think we've spooked them, so we're gonna head back to the swim now. Probably get the rods out for the evening. I've been off stalking, surface fishing with Dave for an hour, and Jay's decided he's gonna empty everything from the escape out into the, the swim. He's a good lad. I walked past Dave's swim. He had exactly the same. Fish, look. <laughs> ah. That's where my dog biscuits were. I was ah. sleeping on them all night. <laughs> all right, maybe I better go and check mine. I didn't see that. Now, to be fair, I'll actually uh, accept this because when we was in Hungary, I put half a pig's head in Jay's bed with all his brains and everything. So yeah, if this is revenge, I'll take it, but no, I won't take it. I'm getting him back. Oh, he's folded that over for me, just out of like my left hand side. Oh, sell boy, leaving a load of rigs. <laughs> oh, Jay, 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 Jay. Last night was very unproductive, no fish at all, no signs of fish, no bleeps or anything else. So I spent a little while this morning with just a bare lead, just trying to find a little bit less silkweed on the bottom, but it is covered in it. Um, it's basically a case of either you're fishing long silkweed or short silkweed. And what I've managed to do, I mean, I'm still going to keep a couple of rods on the chods. I've moved the bottom bead right up now to at least, that's probably about a foot. Um, I know the deepest chod silt and the weed that I found is about that sort of depth so this is going to plug in probably and this chod section this can fly up to here so I've got quite a lot of movement and then sink perfectly in there I've actually got a bit of putty up the line so I know that I've got about six foot of fluorocarbon straight through um, this is the fluorocarbon line I'm using this is all the way through there's no leaders on here whatsoever I've got a bit of putty up about six foot I've got a tungsten bead here I've got the chod section in the middle and another tungsten bead there moving down to a penny safe that's going to drop the lead on the take. Now, that has produced the fish on the first night. It didn't produce anything last night, so I'm still going to stick with this. I'm still going to stick with a white milky malt because I know that caught me a fish. I'm not going to change that, but I am moving the spots over to slightly less uh, silkweed. Fingers crossed we get a, we get a bite. half four in the morning, the mist is rising and the downpours have only just stopped. Fortunately, I got very wet. It's not massive. We thought we'd have a few more bites in this, but we're working hard, we're fishing effectively and efficiently, and hopefully a few more turn up. Unfortunately, we didn't get the fight of this one on camera. The rain has been absolutely ridiculous here. 19 pound six, fall into a small solid bag of boily crumb and pellet with a tiny little mainline pastel wafter doing the business. We're gonna slip this one back and I'll talk you through that solid bag presentation. On the hinge stiff rig presentation, I've got 
probably eight, nine inches of soft coated 25 pound weed boom section, just to flutter down and lay nicely on top of the low lying weed. I've got an anti-tangle sleeve to help kick it out, away from the lead on the cast when I'm hitting the clip. And the chod section itself, I've got a size 11 flexi ring swivel, 25 pound stiff monofilament. This is tied D-rig style. On there I've got a slow sinking pop-up and this is attached to one of the new Apex hooks. These are super sharp and the one fish that I've had so far, that was absolutely nailed on one of these. What I'm gonna opt to do now, I'm gonna fish one rod on a solid bag presentation. I've done quite well on solid bag presentations in the past. Weedy venues, just like we've got faced with here. And the rig itself for that, I've got a very short section of soft uncoated braid, probably two, three inches with a loop at the end that I can attach to the swivel. I'm gonna fish this blowback style with a very small hook bait, a pastel wafter, slow sinking, so it matches the hatch in the food items that are gonna be in the bag. I'm gonna to have to fish this naked on my main line due to the leader band here at Western Park. I'm gonna fish it through a tail rubber, over the lead, size eight RM Tech swivel into the bottom of the lead, fish drop off style. What I wanna do is, because of the weed out there, I wanna be in full contact with the fish. I wanna drop the lead at the earliest convenience and get the fish in the upper layers away from any of the weed. I've had one fish so far on the hinge stiff rig, but I really believe that the solid bag might pick out one of these Wiley residents. The rain had been horrendous all night long, it had kept me awake, plus the uh, odd liner and the bleep here and there, I wasn't really getting much sleep, but there was no mistake in the take when I got it. It fought like an absolute train, it never stopped for one moment until I landed it, but when I did and I see it in the net, what an absolutely stunning fish, I could not have been any happier. You don't get many of them, and I finally got one. I come to Western Park, I've seen loads of photos on the walls, seen loads on the internet, and to be honest with you, these are the ones that we come here to catch, and this is an absolute stunner. As you can see, I've got a bit of clean clothing on, because when I was playing this one, it was tipping down. So, so heavy rain, and it's been raining all night, but getting wet when you're playing carp like this is not a problem. Look at it, what an absolute stunner. Just over 30 pound totally totally blown away probably my biggest fully scaled i've ever had actually and uh yeah i'm very 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 pleased before i put her back um i've noticed that she's had a little bit of a tussle in the reeds at some point there's a little tiny mark in its mouth um the hook hold was spot on right in the middle so i'll put a little bit on that a little bit on the body so all you do make sure it's all bits are out of the way cover the area and as you'll see it goes white and then just a little splash of water and that kind of like hardens it a little tiny bit in the mouth let's get her back Well, the tactical change yesterday paid off massively. 30 pound fully scaled. I'm absolutely buzzing with that one. Whilst I've got a couple of minutes, I've just been in the lake. I've now got changed. I feel all refreshed and uh, I've got to put the rods back out. I've changed the rig back over, put a nice fresh one on and uh, I thought I'd show you what I'm using. So, like I said yesterday, I moved my rod about 10 foot to the left on a new prototype leg clip, fluorocarbon straight through, a little bit of putty up the line and uh, that seemed to do the do. Won't talk too much about the leg clip, it's still in development, but it's a very, very good little product and um, yeah, a bit of a game changer in my opinion. So, we move on to the rig. I've got about eight to nine inches of semi-stiff rock bottom in brown, a short anti-tangle sleeve. If you notice, I've actually made a really big loop. It means the anti-tangle sleeve hasn't got to get caught up on the knot, but also this is a doubled up section. So whilst I've got the tungsten anti-tangle sleeve there, I've also got a doubled up section, which kicks it away just that little bit more than if you add the knot underneath here. Makes life just a little bit easier. Underneath that is a quick link and that will push us together like so. Couple of bits of putty on the hook link. Um, I'm a bit old school, so I still keep the, the putty on the hook links, even though this is rock bottom and it's actually tungsten impregnated, sinks like a stone. I just, for my confidence, I've always put it on there. 
I've got a little bit of 2.4 mil shrink tube. If you notice, I've actually come out the back of the shrink tube, look proper liner liner style onto a slip D rig. Now, all this is is uncoated part of the hook link, uh, doubled up like a multi rig sort of style, and then whipped on with a knotless knot. Very, very simple rig to tie and uh, a size four curve shank. This is one of our new ones, new and improved, absolutely razor sharp. And then I've got a DNA dumbbell wafter. What I will do is add a couple of bits of the new disperse foam nuggets, a couple of bits of that. And the way I attach it, I stick it one that side and then I lick one piece and I lick and stick it like that. If I know that I'm going to be doing a decent cast, I'll actually fold it over again and then again. Lick that bit and stick it. Keep it holding, holding, holding. That should bring them together. Pull that down nice and tight so it's not going anywhere. That will sit on the bottom for quite a while. It won't come off on the cast. It won't come off as soon as it hits the water if you fold it like that. Then eventually that will dissolve. The whole lot will sink to the bottom and sit perfectly waiting for Mr. Carp. Well, I've been given the opportunity of a move by the fishery owner. Rob just come up and said I can move into a swim that's vacated. And I'm a bit hemmed in here. I've got um, Dan one side, Jay the other. Fish just ain't coming through this middle section. So I'm going to move up there into the open area. Just packing my bivvy down. Unfortunately for Richard, poor cameraman, got to pack up with me. So we're off. With the new opportunity to move, I wasted no time getting the gear in the van. I was soon setting up in the new swim and already I felt more confident. This swim had done a couple of fish through the week and it was still evident they were there. With the rigs baited and the rods ready to go, I was brimming with confidence. Now all I had to do was a bit of bait prep, get some bait out there, the deep silt was being turned over by the carp and already I knew that an hour in the right spot was better than 24 hours in the wrong spot. I was excited to see what the night was going to bring. Right, Joe, how's it going, mate? Yeah, all good, mate. How's the, uh, how did the move go? You're all good down there. What made you move in the end, anyway? Mate, I just felt, you know, with all our lines there, it was like restricting all of us, not just me, and um, I was in the centre. I hadn't seen nothing for like a good 24 hours in there, and this, this swim has actually done a few fish this week, and like you know, normally you can't move, but... Rob gave us a little bit of permission to move because we was hemmed in, and he said it would benefit a lot of us, but... Um, there's quite a few fish about. How's it looking up there? I have got two guys, uh, syndicate members. They've moved into my left. Uh, one right down the bay and one just to my left. So my sort of side where I've been fishing, where I them uh, them fish, it's kind of been fished again now. There's there's definitely at least another two more lines within 30, 40 yards of my spot. So is what it is, mate. No one's breaking any rules. No one's doing anything wrong. It's just that's what happens on a busy syndicate lake in England. It's just one of those things. Okay, so I've just got a rig ready to put down the edge here on this marginal shelf. It is quite hard, so where I've had the top bead of this helicopter up to ride the weed, I won't need that now. So I'll bring it down nice and close so that when the fish picks up the bait, the hooking potential is a lot sooner. So bottom bait on that, 
gravel shelf. I don't want to pop up, sticking up on the gravel, all obvious. I want it nice and subtle, laying on the bottom, on its side, with a wafter. I'm just going to cast that down there, and a couple of little catapults of bait over the top. Might bring us on a bite, let's see what happens. So I've just sprayed a bit of pellet along the front of them bushes where I flicked a rod. And now I'm just going to walk behind, put a little bit of pellet in the bush as well so they get used to finding it on the gravel shelf and hopefully follow it out. We might get a bite. After all these years of carp fishing, a screaming alarm in the middle of the night still gets my heart pumping. And as I lifted the rod, I could tell it was definitely a better fish. After a really good scrap, a lovely common lay within the net. With the fish safely retained in a carp sack, I wait for daylight when we could have a proper look at my prize. Well, that move really paid off. Yesterday, I was given some permission to move. Wasn't on any fish up there. Got down here, got some fresh rigs on, fresh bait out. And early hours this morning, the rods rattled off. This lovely 30 pound common, absolute pristine condition from an absolutely beautiful venue. Really pleased with this one. Okay, you may have noticed that I prefer using a sack to a retainer, and there's a few reasons for that. During this session, a few of the fish I've had have been just before first light, and we've had a little bit of permission just to keep hold of them, only for less than an hour, to wait for the light to come up. And I prefer a sack for a few reasons. Firstly, it sits down in the water column, where a retainer holds the fish high in the water, where there's less oxygen. When you're getting the fish out, it's much easier to fill in a sack that the fins are flat. If you want to transfer a fish from a net into a sack, it's a hell of a lot easier than a retainer, unless you're going to put a whole retainer around the net. And also, if you use a sack similar to the one I'm using, I can actually weigh them in it as well. So it has a lot of different features that I prefer to a retainer while fishing in England. Abroad, it's very different. When you start to put fish of 60, 70 pound into a sack, a retainer is much better. But for most of my UK fishing, I tend to use sacks over retainers. Look at that lovely mirror, 26 pound eight. I've been watching fish show over me all day, sitting on the end of the bed chair in anticipation. And finally, the left hand rod's gone. The hinge stiff rig with a Bonoffi pop up has uh, turned up with this lovely, lovely creature. I really believe with Dave making the move further up into the lake, has relieved some line pressure down here between myself and Jay. Fish are starting to feel a bit more confident. They've moved in and I've managed to nick this one. Really, really nice way to go into the evening. No more talking about it The way it is, the way it is It's no mystery There's no getting around it When you're here, when you're here 
we got chemistry We light up when we ignite We are stars in a darkened sky When you leave, don't forget to remember Don't forget to remember Well, our time has come to a close here at the beautiful Western Park. It's been a fantastic trip in wonderful surroundings. We've caught some really beautiful carp. For myself, uh, I believe I fished efficiently, effectively and very accurately in quite difficult conditions. It's been a complete downpour the whole time we've been here, but I've absolutely loved it. It's been good catching up with these lads after lockdown and uh, Onwards and upwards to the next trip, AJ. Yeah, a couple of weeks and we'll be off again, won't we? But I've loved this week. I knew picking that swim would work for me. Loads of water to look at. Just a really nice place to be. And yeah, I can't wait to come back. I've already asked him uh, what availability he's got. Bring the family back here. You know, it's perfect for that, isn't it? It's beautiful. But yeah, I can't wait to get back. I've got to tell you, I did let you both win the challenge. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> on yeah. to the next one, boys. Yeah, Onwards let's and go. Upwards, yeah, like I say, we've had a great week and uh, let's crack on, eh? Let's go, come on. Right. I'm going in that, man. <laughs> so if you have seen the beautiful scenery of Western Park Estate Lake and you fancy a go yourself, you can also book the boathouse swim. It's got three very spacious swims. The boathouse itself has two beds, shower, kitchen, and it is an absolutely beautiful, iconic scenery. If you want to do that, contact them and see what the available space is. Oh, work. Yeah, I'm just fishing in my pants. I right, you know. I'm fishing in my pants all week, aren't I? You know what I mean? My nose all crooked. Oh, there's nails, no. Run the Queen Vic. All I've got to do is hold it out a little bit further. <laughs> no one believes a 30 looks like 30 on me anyway. I might as well make it up. It's all right, Dave. <laughs> what have you found, Dave? Well, I've found that you've never fished accurately in your whole life. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>